Appreciated all the music this morning. I thought it went together nicely. Appreciated your piano playing as well, sir. Thank you. And it's nice that we dedicate our talents to God to glorify His name. And uh, now, from a an article that I wrote, trying to emphasize the importance of God's instructions to us, we must follow His instructions because he knows what he's talking about. You know, all of his counsel has been tried and tested in the fire. We could go the traverse the universe from one end to the other and we won't find anything better because God is perfect in his ways. But this first one is a quote from 4T, page 197. It contains excellent counsel on child rearing entitled Evils of Lax Discipline. It's the title of it. <clears throat> dot, dot, dot. I started in the middle of the sentence, but accountability to God for the training and discipline of their children. Dot, dot, dot. Parents may re well inquire. This is a very good question for us, a very good question. Who is sufficient for these things? Children are high maintenance. You know what I'm talking about. They are born manipulation experts. They get those skills from their parents, their grandparents. This has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. And they're born with an intense skill set already in place. Now, to be fair, we have to admit that part of this is survival skills. And the Lord knows that coming into this world, we're going to need some survival skills. But I've seen little newborn babies, days old, weeks old. Those little people are like sponges soaking everything up. And they learn that those same survival skills can be used to get what they want when they want it, and how they want it. And that's when it starts feeling real manipulative to the parents. And parents start getting thoughts like, will I ever have a free monument ever again to myself, you know? So we gotta learn how to take care of ourselves in the process. And they are tender and fragile in many respects. We certainly don't wanna be shaking them. You've probably heard the Testimonies on shaking baby syndrome, but we can destroy those little brains very easily doing that. And we can crack those little ribs, and they're very tender. Although they're very tough, if they just fall around on their own, they can, get, they, they can go through a lot, but we don't need to be abusing those little babies. But we do need to learn how to manage them effectively. And that's a very good question. Who is sufficient for these things? You know what the answer is? God alone is their sufficiency. And if they leave him out of the question, seeking not his aid and counsel, hopeless indeed is their task. But, but by prayer, by study of the Bible, by earnest zeal on their part, they may succeed nobly in this important duty and be repaid a hundredfold for all their time and care. Now here's a very good question. How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit upon you. I will make known my words to you. Children should be encouraged to become Bible students and have firm religious principles that will stand the test of the perils sure to be experienced by all 
who live upon the earth during the last days in the closing history of this world. Now, who's the Lord talking to here when he says, how long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? Who are these simple ones that love simplicity? He's not talking about us, is he? What do you think? It's a very good question. In Hosea 4, verse 6, it says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Not because I haven't tried to give it to them, but they've rejected my knowledge. I believe he's talking about us. Let's make up our minds not to remain simple about such important things. Now, number two... Keep thinking about the words of this inspired song my wife wrote, but not in number two. Think more about that in number three. Think about it with number one, but here's number two. Listen to this. Page 188 of 4T. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Ye are my friends if you do whatever I command you. So if we're just hearers and not doers, we're deceiving ourselves, right? And we're not friends of God, he says. This is the condition imposed. This is the test that proves men's characters. Feelings are often deceiving. Motions are no sure safeguard, for they are variable and subject to external circumstances. Many are deluded by relying on sensational impressions. The test is, what are you doing for Christ? What sacrifices are you making? What victories are you gaining? A selfish spirit overcome? A temptation to neglect duty resisted? Passion subdued? And willing, cheerful obedience rendered to the will of Christ are far greater evidences that you are a child of God than spasmodic piety and emotional religion. Both of you, this is counsel to a couple in the testimonies for the church. The couple, the husband and wife, both of you have been averse to reproof, murmuring against your best friend. You have not listened to these admonitions and have thus rejected the Spirit of God and turned it from your hearts and have become careless and indifferent in your deportment. I heard a voice saying in reference to you, it is an unfruitful tree. Then I heard the pleading tones of mercy, sweet voice saying, Spare it a little longer. I will dig about its roots. I will prune it. Give it one more trial. If it fails to be fruitful, then you may cut it down. So a little longer probation is granted. You do realize that all of us are on probation. You know that, don't you? We're arraigned before the bar of God is guilty of treason against the government of God. We're deserving of death. That's why Jesus came. He paid the full price, full price, full price for our redemption. Absolute, total, full price. And he earned the right to transform us once again into the image of God. And he can do that. He's the creator. He can recreate us. He can reform our thoughts, our minds, our hearts. He can change us. He can do it. He will not do it against our will because he created us with free will. He gave us our own brain so we can research and do whatever we decide to do. So I would say it'd be really important for us to cooperate with God in this process. So a little longer probation is granted. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered thy children together and you would not. You have done no better in your day than did the poor, self-deceived, blinded Jews in theirs. Strong words to these parents, to this couple. You might have improved your blessed privileges and opportunity and perfected Christian character, but your heart has been rebellious. 
and you would not humble yourselves to be truly converted and live in obedience to God's requirements, you have neglected the expressed word of God. You have slighted and rejected solemn reproofs and gone on in your own selfish, willful way. Sometimes your fears have been aroused, but you still have never realized your wretched spiritual condition and absolute danger. You have repeatedly fallen back again into the same state of indifference and selfishness. You have had a surface work. Surface work. Reading a scripture here and there, quoting it, reading a word or two from the testimony of Jesus and quoting it, but not knowing the essence and the depth of what God's word is all about. A surface work but not the entire transformation which is necessary in order to bring you into acceptance with God. If you had been diligently gathering with Christ, some of these, some of these people about us, some of these would now be with us in the truth. But your lives were a stumbling block to them. Those are serious words, aren't they? I don't want to be a stumbling block to anyone. With the followers of Christ, religion should never be divorced from business. Never. They should go hand in hand, and God's commandments should be strictly regarded in all the details of worldly matters. The knowledge that we are children of God should give a high tone of character, even to the everyday duties of life, making us not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit. Such a religion, such a religion as we are talking about here, as this, bears the scrutiny of a critical world with a grand consciousness of integrity. And I guarantee you, we're living in a critical world. People are sick and tired of nonsense, and they will see through you in a blink of an eye. We need to be real with God. And... God has given us these instructions to help us with this. He obviously loves us very much and wants us to be saved or he wouldn't go to all this trouble for us. So, now, let's go to the third one and just keep in mind the words of the song that Del Jean, I think she was inspired to write that song. But Acts 2 states this, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. That's true of all generations in this world since the fall, but I believe it's even more corrupt today. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. He's still willing to do that. Listen to just a few short testimonies from the Spirit of Prophecy the fourth volume, page 48. In ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. Old Testament prophets, New Testament apostles. In these days, he speaks to them by the testimonies of his spirit. There was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he instructs them now concerning his will and the course that he would have them perceive, pursue, but will they profit from his teachings? God will accept of no partial obedience. He will sanction no compromise with self. But remember, we're talking about a miracle of God's grace transforming us totally into the likeness of Christ. That's something that God can do. Nobody else can do that. In this last vision, I was shown that which fully justifies my course in publishing personal testimonies. When the Lord singles out individual cases and specifies their wrongs, others who have not been shown in vision frequently take it for granted that they are right or nearly right. If one is reproved for a special wrong, brethren and sisters should carefully examine themselves to see wherein they have failed and wherein they have been guilty of the same sin. That makes sense, doesn't it? They should possess the spirit of humble confession. If 
others think them right. It does not make them right just because somebody thinks we're right. God looks at the heart. He is proving and testing souls in this manner. In rebuking the wrongs of one, he designs to correct many. Many are dealing falsely with their own souls or in a great deception in regard to their true condition before God. When those who are not right see that they are guilty of the very sins that have been reproved in others, yet continue in the same unconsecrated course because they have not been specially named, they're endangering their own souls and will be led captive by Satan at his will. Now, why is that? If I don't believe and practice the truth, then what am I going to believe and practice? I'm going to believe and practice a lie. If I'm believing a lie, who's the father of all lies? Who was the liar from the beginning and the follower of all liars? That's Satan himself. And he's the first murderer, and he's the father of all murderers. So his spirit will come right in because that's, right, that's what he's all about. He's going to be really busy with that. There's a great necessity for a reformation among the people of God. The present state of the church leads to the inquiry. Is this a correct representation of him who gave his life for us? That's a good question. Are we rightly representing God? You know? Ellen makes a statement, either we're being a sanctifying influence in one another's lives or we're being an unholy influence. One or the other. There is no fence. We think we're on a fence. There's no fence. Jesus says, if you're not gathering with me, then you are scattering abroad. Period. Why does God not compromise with selfishness? Because selfishness is all about Satan. Satan inhabits that throne. Where God is, Satan is not allowed to stay. He will have to flee. He will have to flee. So choose God and Satan will flee from you. Now, We want to be a correct representation of him who gave his life for us. That's what we've been called to do, right? We're talking about a miracle, right? Nobody can do this. It's totally impossible. It's against my nature to do this. I'm not trying to tell you I'm there. Like Paul said, don't get confused. I'm talking these words to you, but I'm not there. I'm not trying to tell you I'm there, but forgetting where I was, I'm pressing onward toward the mark of my high calling in Christ, right? We're pressing on toward the mark. And with Jesus, we can get it. Without him, we can't do anything. But with him, we can do all things. So, are these the followers of Christ and brethren of those who counted not their lives dear unto themselves, those who come up to the Bible standard, to the Bible description of Christ's followers, will be found rare indeed. Somebody came to Jesus and said, Jesus, is it true that very few will be saved? You know what his answer was? I tell you that broad is the way that leads to destruction and many will enter therein. But narrow is the way that leads to life and few there will be that find it. So everything is stacked really in this world against us. Lucifer's got everything stacked to obscure a knowledge of God to somehow divert our attention to somehow get us off track but God can plow through every bit of that no problem for him but he's not going to do it against our will right because he created us with free wills with our own brain that's the beauty of it all we can do our own research we can make our own choices then we can reap the blessings or the cursings right it's our choice Having forsaken God, the fountain of living waters, they have hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water, said the angel. Lack of love and faith are the great sins of God's people, which they are now guilty of. Lack of faith leads to carelessness and to love of self and the world. While they are professedly serving God, they are to all intents and purposes corrupting their ways before him. Appetite and passion are indulged by many, 
notwithstanding the clear light of truth, that it points out the danger and lifts up its warning voice. Beware, restrain, deny. The wages of sin is death. Yet many rush madly on. Satan has control of their minds and seems to have power over their bodies. Oh, how many flatter themselves that they have goodness and righteousness when the true light of God reveals that all their lives they have only lived to please themselves. How sad and fearful the mistakes that they are making. They're building on the sand but flattering themselves that they're riveted to the eternal rock. Jesus still invites you and me to turn from our course, to take hold of his strength, to find in him that peace, power, and grace that will make us more than conquerors in his name. Now, I read four before three, but this is the one I wanted you to remember the words of the song. The words of the song, remember this one. This quote, Christ is our example. His life is a practical illustration of his divine teachings. His character is a living exhibition of the way to do good and overcome evil. You have nursed your resentment against your husband and others who have wronged you, but you have failed to perceive wherein you have erred and made matters worse by your own wrong course. God sees how hard it is for you to be patient and forgiving, and he knows how to pity and to help. Now, we, were, we need to remember those words. A counsel to another couple in which the wife is extremely critical of her husband and everybody else has been trying to help her. She says, God sees how hard it is for you to be patient and forgiving, and he knows how to pity and to help you. You should seek the help of God, for you need peace and quiet instead of storm and contention. Only God can calm that storm, right? He knows how to calm the storm, whether it be an emotional storm or it be a wind storm. The religion of Christ enjoins upon you to move less from impulse and more from sanctified reason and calm judgment. Your children have the stamp of character that their parents have given them. How careful then should be your treatment of them? How tenderly should you rebuke and correct their faults? You, you are too stern and exacting and have frequently dealt with them when you were excited and angry. This has almost fretted away the golden cord of love that binds their hearts to yours. Wow. I understand how that can happen because children can get on your last nerve. I said to one parent the other day, I said, it's sure a good thing that they're cute. And she said, yeah, or I'd kill them. So she didn't mean that, of course, but those thoughts do go through your mind, you know what I mean? They can be a pain, but so can your husband. So can your wife, you know what I mean? So can people at work. So can people at church. So you should ever impress upon them that you love them. The children need to know that. And you're laboring for their interests. They need to know that. That their happiness is dear to you and that you design to do only that which is for their good. You should gratify their little wants whenever you can reasonably do so. You know, they have little wants. Why not? What's, what's, what's that going to hurt? The power of Satan over the youth of this age is fearful. Unless their minds are firmly balanced by religious principle, their morals will become corrupted by the vicious children with whom they come in contact. It's, it's just pervasive. It's immense. It's just mind-boggling. We've got to have God. We've got to have him. We've got to follow his counsel. We have to have him remolding, reshaping, reforming us. He's the potter. We're the clay. He's the author. He writes the book. He writes the testament. We become a living testament of God. He needs to work it out in us. You fail to understand the seducing power of evil upon youthful minds. Their greatest danger is from a lack of proper training and discipline. The very food they place before the children is such to irritate the tender coats of the stomach. Now all of a sudden in the midst of this, we're talking about what we're eating. This excitement 
is communicated to the brain through the nerves, and the result is that the animal passions are roused and control the moral powers. Reason is thus made a servant to the lower qualities of the mind. The blood becomes fevered, the nervous system unduly excited, and the morals are in danger of being affected. It is impossible for anyone to live temperately, intemperately, excuse me, impossible for anyone to live intemperately in regard to diet and yet restrain a large degree, retain, and yet retain a large degree of patience. So if we want patience, start looking at our dinner table as well. Our Heavenly Father sent the light of health reform to guard us against the evils resulting from a debased appetite. And those who love purity and holiness may use with discretion the good things he has provided for them. And by exercising temperance in their daily lives, they may be sanctified through the truth. You are not uniform in your treatment of your children. At times you indulge them to their injury, while at other times you refuse them some innocent gratification that would make them very happy. Well, extremes, overindulgence, and then keeping from them some little, some little thing, little innocent thing that they would love and find much pleasure in, and you hold it from them. So he's talking to this couple, to this mom and to the dad. You turn from them with impatience and scorn their simple request, forgetting that they can enjoy pleasures that to you seem foolish and childish. You do not stoop from the dignity of your age and station to understand and minister to the wants of your children. In this you fail to imitate Christ. He took little children in his arms and descended to the level of the young, his large heart of love could comprehend their trials and necessities, and he enjoyed their happiness. So let's try to make them happy. There's a lot of innocent things that's not going to hurt. It won't hurt for them to enjoy those things. So I'm going to ask you this question. Is it safe to neglect any of God's word? In these last days, I am under firm conviction that God has poured out his spirit in the latter rain and filled up these books that we have, that we call spirit of prophecy books. Is it safe to neglect those? Why did God give those to us? We've been told that we were neglecting the scriptures. Who here has not neglected the scriptures? Raise your hand. You know, I've neglected the scriptures. All of us have neglected the scriptures. Our parents neglected the scriptures. Our grandparents, it's been going on for generations and generations. We have lost to a great de degree an understanding of who God is and who we are. We need some help. But not only just those books and the scriptures, we need the Holy Spirit to bring it home to our hearts because God has to give you and me our very own message, our very own testimony. And it has to become ours. That cannot be done without the Holy Spirit working. So when we read and study, and when we experience life, we need the Holy Spirit helping us. So who can safely neglect these things? Uh, maybe it would help us to perceive the importance of these wonderful writings that God has given us. I believe they're the testimonies of Jesus. Here's what it says in Revelation. Revelation 19 and verse 10. When the angel appeared to John the Revelator, he says, I fell at his feet. I mean, he was gorgeous. He was glorious. He was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen in his life. Powerful angel of God. I fell at his feet to worship him, he said. And he said to me, see that thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is the spirit of prophecy. Those books. 
this is a testimony of Jesus. Jesus said they talk, it talks about him. This is all about Jesus. My experience, those books are all about Jesus too. You can't afford them to like that. It's the Holy Spirit that's been poured into those books because he can't pour it into Marco or to me because I'm going to forget half of it. I'm telling you. Any of you have trouble with memory? It needs to be written down. So it's written down so that we can read it over and over again. We need some repetition. So I think we should start calling it the testimony of Jesus. Maybe that would help us understand how important it is. Let me tell you an experience I had in Germany. My wife and I noticed that David Gates was going to be speaking at AFCO, which is Amazing Facts College of Evangelism, the one in Europe. So we went over there. We wanted to see that college. We wanted to meet the people there. We went over and met them. It was wonderful. David Gates gave a, a very nice message. There was a German lady there, and I got to talking with her, and she said, I just love these people. She says, they're so wonderful. They preach the Bible. She said, I've been looking for somebody. I go to church, and nobody's preaching the Bible anymore. She says, these people preach the Bible. And she said, I love Doug Batchelor. He preaches the Bible. And I said to her, I said, what about Ellen White? And she looked at me and she says, I love her too. She also preaches the Bible. So, you know, I mean, out of the mouth of babes. She was just a babe in Christ. Learning that something was going on in the world that she appreciated so much that she didn't even know existed anymore. Been trying to find it for years. So, I think we need to listen to what the babes are saying. You know what I'm saying? Children shall lead them, it says. These books have brought more people into present truth than any other thing that the church has done. I became good friends with a chaplain who was a major in the army in Germany. And he was a Catholic and he was in Africa and he went to the library and as he was looking through the library books, one of them caught his attention. It was one of the great controversy books under the title of Cosmic Conflict. Some of you may have seen it. So he looked at that and he thought, hmm. He sat down and started reading it and he goes, wow, this is good. They wouldn't let him check it out. He had to read it there. So he got up early the next morning, spent the whole day. He says, I read that whole book in one day. He said, I was floored. He said, I did. He said it was amazing. And he didn't even know an Adventist existed. Somewhere along the line, the Lord introduced him to some Adventists. He found Adventists existed. Found out that that book had another title, The Great Controversy. He became an Adventist chaplain. He's serving in the United States Army as a chaplain. So, do you know Steve Wahlberg? A Jewish man. He stood up and said, you know how I came into the church, he said? Desire of Ages. He said, I just love that book. I read that book several times and it led me into this church. I mean, over and over and over again, I could go on and on, people reading these books. Ellen White said, more people have come into this church by reading those books than anything else the church has ever done. So, I mean, you know, I, all, all I know to do is direct you to ex experiment with it yourself. Find out for yourself. God gave every one of us our own brain. He gave us our own free will. We do our research. We make our own decisions. We receive the blessings or the cursings based on our decisions. It's our choice. But I would call your attention to give it serious consideration. Um, let me tell you, they, these are some excellent insights, a couple, and, I'm, and then I'm getting ready to share one, two, three magic with you. But from Prophets and Kings, 588 and 9, here's a quote. Look at this. Satan has an accurate knowledge of the sins that he has tempted God's people to commit. He keeps a, a very good record. And he urges his accusations against them, declaring that by their sins they have forfeited divine protection and claiming that he has a right to destroy them. 
He pronounces them just as deserving as himself of exclusion from the favor of God. Are these, he says, the people who are to take my place in heaven and the place of the angels who united with me? But while the followers of Christ have sinned, they have not given themselves up to be controlled by satanic agencies. They have repented of their sins and have sought the Lord in humility and contrition and the divine advocate pleads in their behalf. He who has been most abused by their ingratitude, who knows their sin and also their penitence, declares the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. I gave my life for these souls. They are graven upon the palms of my hands. They may have imperfections of character. They may have failed in their endeavors, but they have repented. And I have forgiven and accepted them. Now, let's just take a quick look at Zechariah, and then I'll do the one, two, three magic. Zechariah chapter three. Zechariah chapter three, verses one through four. I'll wait a minute till you get there because it's really important. So say amen when you've arrived. Zechariah is just before uh, Malachi, which is just before the New Testament, Matthew. So it's Zechariah, then Malachi, and then Matthew. Everybody there? And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Isn't that what we are? We're brands plucked from the fire. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. That represents the new character, the new mind, the new heart that God is able to do as our creator. God will recreate us. He will take away our filthy characters, our lewd ways, our unclean ways, and he will purify us. He's got the power to do it. We need him to help us with our children. It, who's sufficient? You know, who's sufficient? Only God. God will help us, though, because he's called us to minister. Okay, does everybody have the handout? Anybody not have one of these? Okay. Yeah. All right. So, the, those. I'll tell you what. Well, let me just say this. This little program, 123 Magic, what it says on the front of the front page, it says through ages 2 to 12. It's very important that we don't get sidetracked by that. That is not true. Made those really quick. Very good. There's a nice little machine in there. Does good work. Okay, you notice, yeah, 2 to 12. The principles in here are for all ages, okay? The principles are for all ages. I was sharing this information with a female soldier.
And I was very concerned that this female soldier not get thrown off by the 2 to 12 because it's for all ages, right? And so I said to her, I want to make sure you're not misunderstanding. This is good. You can use this with babies even. I mean, it's a little bit different application, of course, but the principles are useful with babies. And, uh, and it's useful for teenagers and even adults. And she said, that's what she said. She said, yeah, she said, because we'd already gotten into it quite a ways. She says, I'm thinking about using this on my husband, is what she said. So I thought, wow, I was wasting my breath. She, she understood what I was saying. But don't get thrown off. I think some people might get thrown off by that. And I want to tell you that the people I've shared this with, the Marines, the soldiers, the airmen, and their families that I've shared this with, they said, Marvin, thank you for wrapping our minds around these concepts because when we went over to New Parent Support to get the materials, we were able to realize how important certain things were that otherwise would have just went over our heads. And if we don't understand the importance of these things, it doesn't work. Every important little piece needs to be applied or it doesn't work. So people go and they go, yeah, it doesn't work. That's not true. It works. I guarantee you it works. But before we start looking at it, I'll just, and I'm going to go through it pretty quick. It won't take long. On the inside of the very last page, you see that great list of things there? <clears throat> I just want you to know that there's books for teachers, there's videos, there's leader guides, there's books for adolescents, okay, so therefore it's for adolescents too, not just 2 to 12, right? There's books, there's books for children who have attention deficit disorder, you know, it's, it's, it's useful everywhere. And, um, you know, these DVDs could be helpful in showing you how to apply it to different age groups. So you can look at it and see what you think. But now, this page, that's about the author. The author is a clinical psychologist. He raised two children of his own, 20 years working in this field, working with children and youth. That's his specialty, children and youth. You can read about that on your own. I'm not gonna take much time on that. You can look at it on your own. But look at page one. Page one, okay? Now, consider this. When do we use the 123 magic protocol, right? To stop unacceptable behavior, to encourage good behavior, to manage testing and manipulation behaviors, and to establish a peaceful, enjoyable family atmosphere. I'm going to tell you straight up, there will never be a time when you're not needing to do all those things. So you really need something like this, you know what I mean? This is an ongoing process, an ongoing process. Use the one, two, three counting procedure to stop behaviors such as arguing, fighting, screaming, tantrums, and teasing. Once again, that's an ongoing process. This all has to be brought under wise management. For start behaviors such as eating good foods at proper times, doing your homework, going to bed on time, cleaning your room, getting up and out in the morning so we're not late for work and for school. This, needs, this is a constant deal, too, that has to be worked on. And here's the seven tactics that you use to accomplish these tasks. There's seven tools in the toolbox, and one, two, three, special application is one of seven. Now, let me point out some things about these seven tools. Positive reinforcement. I would like to thank Marco for his diligence. He has just been working, working, working. Look at him. That is good. Awesome. And there's one over here. Is that just two more? Any? One, one, two. How many more? One, two, three, four, five, six. Is that right? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven more? Make ten just in case. Say it again. 
Oh yeah, one per family. I guess we're doing one per family, right? <laughs> okay, now. <clears throat> now these seven tactics. See, I know that Diane uses this at school. You've taught Marco all about this? Or, huh? You've been using it on Marco? What did you say? <laughs> well, there's a special application for adults, which I'll be talking about this evening, that right at, you know, after lunch. I'll be talking about that at three. So, <clears throat> now, um, let me just share this thought. Just so you understand that we decided to apply these principles with our little granddaughter. Our oldest son has two little girls. The youngest one was one and one half months old. One and one half months old. She was one and a half months old. And she was hungry. She's a real talker. She was just babbling, but she loves to talk, likes to make eye contact, just loves that. And just yakety yakety yak all the time. And so it was time for her to eat. We already anticipated that. We knew it was time for her to eat. We had the bottle on the stove. It was warming up. It needed five minutes to warm up. So she started being rude, I thought. She's going, Wah! you know what I'm saying? Just, just like, where are you idiots? I'm hungry. You know, it was just terrible. I thought that was the rudest thing. I said, Ellie, Ellie. And she looked at me, and I made eye contact with her, and I said, we know you're hungry. We got the bottle on the stove. It'll be five minutes, and we'll have it back to you, okay? And then she closed her eyes, and she started again, you know. I said, Ellie, Ellie, hey, Ellie, wait, look at me. She looked at me again, and I said, now listen, you doing that's not going to get you going to get your bottle one minute quicker. It's not going to come any quicker by you acting like that. It'll be here. Well, it's only going to be four minutes now, and we'll have it here. So she liked to be talked to. She enjoyed us looking at her. And after a while, after we did it for a while, she started understanding what the words mean. Because when the bottle came, I said, see, I told you we'd have it. Here it is. You know, and I gave it to her. So we were teaching her not to be rude and disrespectful, even though she had a need that needed to be fulfilled. She needs to understand that, now, if you're not paying attention to the babies, and you're not taking care of their needs, maybe you need to be screamed at. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a, it's a survival tool. But if you're going to be attentive, she doesn't need to scream at you. I don't want her thinking that that's going to cause me to do for her what I know she needs done for her, you know? So when we got to church, the ladies were sitting around and enjoying her. Everybody wanted to share her and hold her. And they said, look at her. She's not happy with us, but she's so respectful about it. I thought, hey, it was paying off, you know? Isn't that cool? We should not allow, and in the spirit of prophecy, we're told, do not allow them to throw fits and to throw tantrums. So how do you not allow them, you know? I mean, use some skill, you know? Make eye contact, talk to them, they love that. Tell them what's going on. They'll eventually learn the words because they're very smart, like little sponges, soaking up all kinds of information. They'll figure out what those words mean. So, anyway, that's just how you can use it with a baby. But I'm just saying these principles are useful everywhere, even with your husband or your wife. But I will talk about that in this afternoon's session because some of those same principles we'll be using there. Now, like I'm talking about, positive reinforcement. We've got to understand that people have a strong predisposition to get very critical when somebody is annoying them, whether it be children or other adults, husbands, wives, people at church, in the community, at work. And super critical is not helpful. That discourages people. People will finally begin to wonder, can I even please you? I don't think I can. And they just give up. You know what I'm saying? So positive reinforcement, even though you have a child that is a handful, if you see even so much improvement, just a smidge, 
say, Johnny, I see what you're doing. And I want you to know that I can see you're trying and I want you to know I really, really appreciate it. Give them some positive strokes. You know what I'm saying? Very important. Doesn't always work, but rotate it in the mix. Keep bringing it in from time to time because everybody needs some positive strokes, some positive reinforcement. Simple request. If you're in the kitchen, you're in there frantically working because you've got guests coming, trying to get everything cleaned up, trying to get everything made. you got the kids, they're all fixed up out there. You bought things for them. They should have everything they need to keep them happy. They're going to want the same thing at the same time. They're always going to want that. So they're going to be in a big fight out there. If you're yelling from the kitchen, that's not going to help. It's background noise. They don't care about that. They're focused on what they're doing. They don't even hear what you're saying. But if you can take a break and go in and get down on their level and look them right in the eye and make a simple request, it doesn't always work, but sometimes it does work. And it works often enough that we should rotate it in the mix from time to time. So you'd go in there and you'd say, Johnny, Daddy really needs you to do this for him. Will you do this for Daddy? You know? doesn't always work, but it does more often than you'd realize. Yeah. So, simple request. Rotate it in the mix. Kitchen timer. Children need to learn to take turns and to share. It's against our nature to share and take turns. We don't want to. However, when it's our turn and we want our share, we want our share, we want our turn, but we don't want to give it to anybody else. So, uh, kitchen timer can be useful. Turn that thing, if it's just a five minute activity, say, okay, Sally, for five minutes you've got it. When the timer goes off, you give it to Johnny. And then you set it back to right there on five. When it goes off, then it'll be your turn again, Sally. Or if there's more children, it's the next person's turn. Teach them to self-regulate. Teach them to take turns, you know, and share. Because they're learning social skills. And I guarantee you at kindergarten and at school, they're more interested in the social skills than they are whether they know their one, two, threes or their ABCs. They want to know, can Johnny get along with the other kids? Can they share and take turns with the others? So they need to learn these social skills. The docking system, that is where if you have an allowance or if you got points, get so many points, we're going to go to the park because everybody loves to go to the park and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, you can say, well, we've just lost a point. That means we won't be going to the park this evening. But they go, oh, Dad, Mom, come on. You're right, you know, and they, they start doing it. And they say, oh, wow, okay, you're going to do that? You know you're supposed to, right? Yeah, and it's the right thing to do, yeah. And so I said, well, maybe we will go to the park after all, you know. Don't think of any of these things as punishment. It's not punishment. They're behavior modification tools. Things to help us do what's right. Okay? Natural consequences. We need to learn natural consequences. If Johnny's hitting Jimmy in the face, somebody's going to get hurt. And it might not be Jimmy. Jimmy might get tired of that and hurt Johnny, right? Somebody's going to get hurt. So that's not a safe activity. We don't do that. So... And if we're abusing our toys, we're going to break them, then we don't have our toys. So, you know, natural consequences. It's important to teach that as you can. Charting is if you've got a child that can't seem to understand the audible words, then maybe you need to write it all out, chart it out, let them know here's what you do, and, you know, and then they can kind of check it off. If you need to do something like that, do it. One, two, three, special application. Let me describe that a little bit later, okay? As, as we do a little bit more, and then I'll describe that real quick. Page two, let's look at page two real quick. Many parents and teachers have an idea about kids that causes a lot of trouble. This idea is called the little adult assumption. Now that's what he calls it, the little adult's assumption. I don't agree with that. I wish he wouldn't call it that, really, because I see children as miniature adults. I'm not saying they're perfectly mature, but I tell you, they amaze me at their capabilities. They really do. But anyway, he describes what he means by that term, and I'm totally on board with his definition. Totally. 
The little adult assumption is the belief that kids have hearts of gold, are basically reasonable and unselfish, just smaller versions of us. I have a problem with that, just smaller versions of us. I don't think we're totally reasonable and unselfish ourselves. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so anyway, if you believe this, it then makes perfect sense to you to give your children rational explanations of why they should or should not do something and expect them to immediately see the light. Then, of course, they would change their behaviors. He's just saying kids are kids. They're not little adults. They're, they are born unreasonable and selfish, and it's our job to help them become the opposite. If you want to help them mature into responsible adults, you need to begin thinking of yourself as a... He likes to use the word trainer. I would rather say educator or teacher. And choose a method largely nonverbal, repeated until the, I'm going to say student instead of trainee, does what you, the teacher, wants. The teacher is patient and gentle. Now that's extremely important. Patient and gentle. I cannot overemphasize how important that is. And that's what, what that one parenting tool, Scream Free Parenting, is all about. Getting yourself under control so you can get your children under control, you know. So... Um, um, patient and gentle, extremely important. But even though you're patient in general, that doesn't mean that you're not persistent. You're persistent. Why are we persistent? The rules are simple. We're going to do things that are safe, right? We don't want anybody getting hurt. So if you're jumping off of that table, it's got a sharp corner, somebody could even get killed could be severely injured. You're leaving your toys out, somebody talk, stomp on them, break them, trip over them and fall and hurt themselves, end up in the hospital, who knows what. So we're going to do safe things. So one of the rules is being safe, having safety protocols. One of the rules is being fair and taking turns because everybody wants their turn and everybody wants their fair share. None of these are going to change, are they? Why should they change? They don't need to change. Everybody's going to clean up their mess when they're through because nobody around here is anybody else's slave. I'm not going to ask you to clean up all my messes. I don't need to be running around cleaning up your messes. And we may need to help them. We're going to probably have to help them and show them how to do it and get down and, and you know, work with them. But eventually they will learn as they mature more and more that they need to clean up their messes. They need to clean up their room. They need to pick up their toys, put them back where they belong. So the rules, we need to be persistent about the rules which are very good rules, and um, patient and gentle. The literature documents that when parents discipline their children when they're angry, that it communicates rejection to the children. So you're creating a bigger problem. You're going to create depression and anxiety in the children. So, I mean... If, if the guys came home from work and their wives were constantly criticizing them every time they got home, would you start feeling rejected by your wife? Or what if the husband's always criticizing the wife? Would she start re feeling rejected by the husband? What if your boss is a real jerk and he's constantly criticizing you about everything? Would you feel like he didn't like you and he was rejecting you? You know what I'm saying? The children feel the same way. The children absolutely feel the same way. So, now I'm thinking since we're all eating here, and the next program's at three, there's no big rush. But if nature is calling, you might need to exit for a while. But nevertheless, we're almost through. We're getting there. Being patient in general, I can't overemphasize how important it is, but very persistent. Fortunately, the education will eventually work. You will not need to repeat the process forever and ever. Now, three. One, two, three magic will work for parents and other caregivers who avoid the two biggest mistakes people make when they begin to use the program. Now, this is extremely important. If you don't do all of these things, it won't work. It's not going to work. So, if you need to go do Scream 3 parenting or something first or whatever, do whatever you got to do. But this does work if you do it right. Too much talking and too much emotion are the two biggest mistakes. Now let me ask you a question, husbands. 
If your wife just goes on and on and on about something, what do you do? See, now remember, just remember a thought. Here's a thought, a New Testament thought. Paul spoke to the people until midnight. Eutychus fell out of the window. Spoke on until early in the morning and they accompanied him down to the, to the uh, coast in which he got on a ship. So, too much talking. You get tuned out, right? Too much talking, you, you get tuned out. The children will tune you out. They will become parent deaf. Too much emotion. I already talked about how discipline and anger discourages them and they feel rejected. He goes on to say, too much talking is a mistake because it either does not work or it takes you through the talk, persuade, argue, yell, hit syndrome. You do not want to role model that for them because there's going to be trouble at school. Too much emotion is a mistake because the child enjoys the power that comes with getting a parent very upset. If you have a child who's doing something you don't like, get real upset about it on a regular basis and sure enough, he or she will repeat it for you. It's kind of like the bullying. They say with bully busting techniques, you do not show the bully your emotions. You do not. Because that adds fuel to the fire. They're enjoying that. So, no sense setting up that kind of a scenario. One, two, three magic is simple. It's straightforward. It works if used properly with no talking and no emotion. It's easy to train or educate babysitters, grandparents, other caretakers to use it. And teachers can use it effectively in schools. Consistency is important for children. But we live in a world in which the grandparents may think they already know everything. They've been around a while. The teachers want to run their classroom the way they want to run their classroom. Everybody's not going to do it. But you can tell your children this is what your dad and mom have decided to do. We believe it makes a lot of sense. And this is what we're going to do at home. So they can learn that that's the way it's going to work at home. Now page four. I'll do the one, two, three application and explanation on page six. Page four, it's easy to get started with the one, two, three magic program. Sit down with your children and tell them you're going to start using a different method of discipline. Remember the little adult assumption. Just because you explain it rationally, does not mean the kids really get it. In fact, they may not get the idea until you've been counting for a while and they've been to their rooms a few times. Don't expect them to be grateful. They may think this is simply a phase that you're going through and that you'll get over it in a few days. But stick to it, get going, and when in doubt, count. So just do it. Now, five, many children will respond to this discipline by immediately testing their parents and caregivers. Their behavior will get worse before it gets better. If you are prepared, you can handle the testing and reduce the time that you have to deal with it. Testing occurs when a child is frustrated by not getting what he or she wants. The primary purpose of testing is to win by getting you to concede. The second purpose is revenge, which kicks in when the first one fails. So basically what they're saying is, you didn't give me my, what I wanted, you will be sorry. You will wish you had given me what I wanted. You know? So, I have seen parents get so frustrated with this whole process that they've made up their mind, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit giving you what you want for doing this to me. And they hold out for maybe an hour, hour and a half. They say, no, absolutely not. But they don't stop the children from manipulating them. They don't stop them. Until finally they get frustrated at the end and just throw up their hands and say, okay, go ahead, do whatever you want. You know. Now they've taught their children, if you will pester me for an hour and a half, I will finally give you what you want. And we've got programs on TV about super nannies that come into homes to try to help correct all of this. This becomes a huge problem. I'd say do not do that to yourself, please. But if you've done it, you can use these techniques to help. And there's others around. New parent support if you have a child under six or I'm willing to help. There's others that will help help you figure out how to apply this. Now, the testing manipulation tactics, there's six different categories of manipulations. 
the badgering. That's where they're going, please, please, please. Or why, why, why. That is badgering. And that's very annoying. You know what I'm saying? Very annoying. Intimidation. That's the tantrums, the swearing, the yelling, the slamming things. That's very annoying behavior. The threatening. Something bad will happen. They will even threaten you that something bad's going to happen, you know? Martyrdom. That's crying and pouting and not eating, etc., until you're going, oh, you poor thing. Okay. Okay, you can have it. You know? Don't do that. Buttering up, like doing and saying nice things until you're going, okay, you got me. Go ahead. Physical tactics like hitting, breaking things, and running away. If the child continues testing and manipulation tactics, it is because they are successful. The one, two, three magic program, in order for it to work, you must manage these tactics. Now here's how it works. You've had your conversation with the older children. If it's a baby, you do things like what I told you I did with our little baby. But if they're older and you've had your family council, you've had your conversation, they know what the deal is. That you're going to ask them to do what you want them to do. And if they do one of these manipulations, any one of them, you go, okay, Johnny, that's one. You ask them again. You say, now you know what daddy or mama wants you to do. Please do it. And they do another manipulation. You go, okay, that's two. And you ask them a third time, now you know what you need to do. And then they just point blank, say, no, I'm not going to do it. Well, that's three. You need to take a time out. So they have chosen to go into time out. It's their choice. Now they can go sit over on the couch or on the bean bag. They, they need to go over there and sit and calm down, get themselves under control, be able to self-regulate their emotions. As soon as they think they're under control, they can come back and join the group and have fun with everybody. Right? But they know what to do. They're simple rules. We're sharing, taking turns. We're not going to be unsafe and dangerous. We're not going to do these things. We're not going to abuse our property. So, if they throw themselves down on the floor and start a screaming conniption, I'm going to ask them, doing things you want them to do. Okay? The stop behaviors, and then you do the start behaviors. It's a good idea to use the 1, 2, 3 magic counting method for stop behaviors for a week to 10 days before beginning the start behavior part of the, pro part of the program. Otherwise, things may get way too complicated and we want to keep it simple. Okay? Now, if you don't have the time and energy to really do service to the protocol, then it's going to take more than 7 to 10 days. It might take a month, but whenever you feel like you've got the stop part of the program in really good order, then start the startup part. Do not be surprised when your children react to the start behavior program with testing and manipulation. Their lives have been disrupted. They're not feeling particularly grateful for the opportunity to keep their rooms clean, go to bed on time, etc. But notice you use the same toolbox, all the same tools, to start the start part of the, of the behavior program. And then page seven, as your home moves from dictatorship to democracy, and really, to be honest, I don't see this as a dictatorship. There's not, a, there's not punishment. There's natural consequences. There's behavior modification techniques. They make their own decision if they're not going to bring themselves under wise management. They need to go take a time out until they calm down. So, but he calls it a dictatorship. Anyway, it can be more to democracy, he says. It's appropriate to start giving the children more of a say in the issues that affect them. The family meeting is a good way to start giving the kids a voice in household operations. You can use it to get, discuss not only discipline, but also issues such as laundry, allowances, bedtimes, renting movies, vacations, food fights, etc. Examples are provided in the book and the video. So, there you go. That's my explanation, which I've been encouraged by military people to give this explanation to people that it really helps to put the moving parts all together. It is important that all of these parts, that they are, you've got to be in control of yourself, you've got to remain calm as you do it, and you've got to be consistent. 
but I like to call it merciful management, but uh, what's the word for it? Uh, strict government, because the rules don't change. The rules do not change. So it's a strict government with merciful management. Why? Because old habits die hard. The children inherit habits from their parents and grandparents before them. They come into the world with things that you know, are just not all that helpful. And they've picked up habits from others. And it takes time. And, but this is a real... Does it make sense to you at all? So I think it's the best little tool I've ever seen. So we need a good, wise child management tool to help us. But we need to remember God has to be with us in the whole thing. Well, let's go ahead and have our prayer for the food. I will offer the blessing right here. And I, I, I suppose food is ready, or maybe we need to get it ready when we get over there. But uh, we'll go over there and we can eat. And then we can come back here and we can do at 3. I'm going to be sharing with you the very best assertive communication problem-solving skills that I've ever found out about, the best one that mankind knows about. I'm also going to share human traits and characteristics that tend to negate the effectiveness of even the very best skills and how to navigate through that anyway and still reach your goals. And I'm going to share with you all you would need in a toolbox that you could restore a relationship that is already in the toilet. And you decide it's a classic. It's worth saving. You want to get it out of the toilet, get it back on the road. I will give you a realistic understanding of how much time it's going to take and what kind of actions you need to be engaged in to restore that relationship. Then you can use that to fine-tune a lot of lesser trouble, troublesome relationships or whatever that you go through in life. But these are respectful ways to do that. And we'll be doing that after we eat. So let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we've had together. Thank you for taking so much time with us to teach us so many things, to fill your, your holy word with all the wisdom and what you've done in these last days, giving these wonderful truths to us, to teach us about all kinds of things, things that are important to life. We just pray that you will bless us, bless this food to our strength, and bless us as we continue wherever we have to go and those that are able to come back to the program this afternoon and bless us during that program. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, just so you know, the one this evening, I can do it talking as fast as I talk in about 45 minutes. But if you want some question time or you want to brainstorm some stuff, we could take a little longer if whoever wants to stay longer. one of us our message the message is in the scripture I believe it's also in these books the message is there but is it your message it has to be your message if it has not been internalized by you and me we're not going to have a message only God can do that for us so I'm praying that what we did tonight will help us with our message. Just remember, this is for you, but it's not only for you. It is for you to internalize so this will be part of your message. And if it's made yours, it will be part of your message. So I think what we're doing is extremely important, and I'd like for us to bow our heads and ask that the Holy Spirit would be with us, would work with each one of you, whether we are just children 
or whether we're adults, whatever age we are, that he will help us to have our message that only God can give us. Only God can give us our message. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, you have promised your Holy Spirit to us. You've told us we're two or more gathered in your name, agreeing on anything that you will be in our midst. And we come here to agree in your word. That's what we've come to do, to be built up in your word, to be taught by you. And we ask you to be with us. And we ask you to give us our message so that we can have a work together with Christ as co-laborers with him. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, each of you, I think, has a handout. Have you received your handout? Well, I think uh, Maisa is getting ready to give it to you now. And um, now... I'd like to read a couple of passages as she's passing those out from this little book, Ministry of Healing, which I am under intense conviction, I believe, by the Holy Spirit, that this book <laughs> is the ministry of Christ. I mean, it's, um, it's outlining for us in something that we could comprehend and wrap, wrap our minds around our ministry. And in this ministry... There is amazing topics. Here's the table of contents. All kinds of topics. It's a broad range of very important topics that are extremely important today for all men and women and children. And there are six chapters, six, starting there and going all the way to here, six chapters on the ministry of the home, the builders of the home, the choice and preparation of the home, the mother, the child, home influences, and I want to read just two paragraphs out of the builders of the home. Listen to this very carefully. The family tie is the closest, the most tender and sacred of any on earth. Wow. That's intense. It was designed to be a blessing to mankind, not just the family, but to mankind. It is a blessing wherever the marriage covenant is entered into intelligently. That's an operative word. Lots of people get married and they don't do it intelligently. Have you noticed? That happens all the time. But when it's entered to, into intelligently, and what we're doing tonight is to try to have some intelligence about all of this. And in the fear of God, intelligently and in the fear of God, and with due consideration for its responsibility. It will be a blessing, not just to that family, but to all of mankind. And then over here, in the same chapter, it says, but remember that happiness will not be found in shutting yourselves up to yourselves, satisfied to pour out all your affection upon each other, Seize upon every opportunity for contributing to the happiness of those around you. Remember that true joy can be found only in unselfish service. Forbearance and unselfishness mark the words and acts of all who live the new life in Christ. As you seek to live his life, striving to conquer self and selfishness, and to minister to the needs of others, you will gain victory after victory. This is, thus your influence will bless the world. Okay? So what we're doing is definitely for you. And for me, it's for us. But it's more than that. It is absolutely for the whole world that God will call each of us and give us our ministry and that we can be very effective for the Lord. So... What you have there in your hand, let me explain a little bit about that. I want you to know that the research that's been done, and this research has been documented in the body of literature that's respected by the scientific community and the medical community, it has been discovered that there are three huge important areas in life. 
And if something goes wrong in one or more of those three areas, a person could get very, very discouraged, even to the point of giving up. And when we give up, such things as suicidal thoughts and homicidal thoughts can come in and begin to take over because that's all part of the giving up scenario. Those three things are our relationships. All of our relationships, the relationships at home, at work, and in the community. Some relationships are more important to us than others, but all of these relationships are important. The second one is our money. Our money is very important to us. And our career tracking, because the money and our careers, they go together very intimately. So that could be very discouraging if something goes wrong there. And our health. Our health is very important to us. If the health goes bad, it can be extremely discouraging. Now, let me just say just a few words about this. Most people's health problems are because they're not paying due attention to lifestyle protocols. They're violating natural laws of health. The laws of human physiology. People don't even study those laws. And they're terribly violating those laws. Just one case in point. If we do not eat properly, our bodies are bioelectrochemical machines. If we do not eat properly, we are clogging up the delicate machinery in the body. There are people over at the hospital waiting in line to get quadruple bypass heart surgery and valve replacement. A lot of this stuff, along with many, 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 many other diseases, are lifestyle diseases that can be corrected through beginning to live according to God's natural laws of health, the laws of human physiology. All of this stuff impacts one another. That's going to impact our finances too, is it not? Yes. It's going to impact our ability to hold down our jobs. It's going to impact our friendships. It's going to put a lot of stress on our friendships, on our relationships, at home, at work, in the community, everywhere. So all of this is all tied together in one, one great big whole. Now let me say as an example on this that if you had a muscle car and you did not use a high-grade, high-octane fuel in that car, you're messing that car up. It's not going to perform right, and you're going to have a lot of expense. You're going to clog up the injectors and the valves. You're going to have to do some work on the car. So we need to pay attention to what we eat, as well as our exercise program, those eight natural laws. Now, on the relationship part, here's something I'd like to throw out to you that's very important. Have you noticed that even these children that go to school with weapons and kill their classmates end up killing themselves too or getting killed in the process when they study their lives find out that they felt like they did not have any friends? That their peers and classmates were rude to them and had rejected them. Looks to me like they gave up. They gave up, they decided they didn't want to be here anymore, and they decided to make a decision for their peers that they might as well not be here either. Do you know what I mean? So they made a decision. So when I talk to police officers who do education in the community, what they tell me is that young people that are vulnerable to gangs are people that feel like their families don't care about them. Their families don't care about how they feel or what they want or what they need. They won't listen to them. And they are looking for belonging somewhere. And in that gang, they belong, even though the, initiation, the initiation rights are very stiff. And also, these gangs are very intimately tied in with organized crime. So if somehow you get crossways and you know too much, you may be killed all kinds of stuff going on there, but they would rather be there and belong, you know, than to not belong. So our relationship's important. 
everywhere you look, relationships are very important. Our money is important. Money's involved with our life as well. So, um, now what we're looking at here on this sheet of paper, which you can keep and you can use as part of your ministry, is uh, these are 16 areas of life. And where we came up with these, I see them as a further breakdown of those three. Breaking it out into 16 specific categories, but all of them are related to those three that I just talked to you about, every one of them. And how we found out about these is when couples were getting a divorce, some people went to them and asked, what happened? You know, what went wrong? Every time they identified that there was something amiss with one or more of these 16 areas. Every time they identified one or more of these 16 areas that they were not able to discuss respectfully and come up with a fair and equitable solution to both of them. And they just said, I can't live like this. I've tried and tried and tried and nothing's getting better. It's, it's not working, I can't do it. And that's what happened. So. Let's take a look at these, and I will give you a little, kind of little nutshell uh, idea of what kinds of things are involved in each one of these, so you would know what kinds of things, but it's just an intro. There's all kinds of different things, but it's a very good intro, and it gets right down to what actually goes on in people's lives. The first four, you might would think that um, they are nitpicky. But even though they seem to be nitpicky, remember they are part of the 16 that are very important. They may be nitpicky, but they're very important. I've had couples come to me and tell me something like this, Marvin, it's gotten to where we are arguing all the time, every day, several times a day we're arguing and we're arguing about the stupidest little stuff they say. So I think they're talking about things in these first four, you know what I mean? Marriage expectations guarantee that when most people get married, they have unrealistic expectations about the marriage. One of them thinks it's going to be like this. The other one thinks it's going to be like that. And later on, they find out that what they thought is not what the other one thought at all, and they're just totally shocked. They just can hardly believe it. So we need to have realistic expectations about love, commitment, and conflicts. And now remember, this is very important even to single people, even to little children, to brothers and sisters, to best friends, to little playmates. It's important to everybody. So because your best friend is going to have some expectations about what your friendship with them means. And I've talked to some people whose best friends were so high maintenance that they were seriously wondering, should they be best friends with that person? Have you ever seen anything like that? So this applies to everybody. Nobody is exempt. But I do like to use marriage terminology because I believe that the marriage is the most intense friendship, the very best friendship that one would, could ever have outside of your friendship with Christ and our Heavenly Father and Holy Spirit. So it's the most intense friendship. It's the best friends scenario. So I will use couple terminology, but remember, it's useful to everybody, single, even little children, everybody. Now, <coughs> there is a book that's been written. Many of you may have heard of it called The Five Love Languages. Has anybody ever heard of the book? There is a workbook that goes with that book, and there's a seminar that's been developed. And it does emphasize a lot this business of the five love languages. And what it's saying is something like this. Whenever we do things for one another, we do what we ourselves would want. But that's not necessarily what the other person wants. Case in point, let's say I came from a family that was big on gifts and I'm so used to receiving gifts, it makes me feel loved and appreciated. And I just love gifts. And so I'm giving my wife all these gifts, but she doesn't care about gifts. She's thinking, you are wasting our money. 
She's been stacking those out in the garage. It's gotten where she can hardly get her car in the garage. She's really annoyed. And she's thinking about calling Charity to have him come and haul it all off. And here you think you're expressing your love to her and you're just annoying her. You know what I'm saying? So that's the only thing. I don't want to dwell on this too long. I just want to say, what's wrong with just communicating? Why don't we talk about it? Why don't we listen to one another and find out what this person likes and what that person likes? And, and you know, if you like gifts, maybe she could learn that and she could get you some gifts. But then you do something else for her. Maybe she wants you to listen to her and understand her, you know, and uh, be supportive of her. So, so that's all I'm going to say, but there's a lot more that could be said, you know, right? Now, cohabitation issues. Do we agree on our experience as a cohabiting couple? Now, this could be best friends deciding to rent a place together because they're tired of spending all their money for housing, you know, so they're going to share the expenses. But I tell you what, living with another person can be a real pain because everybody's got their own little habits and quirks and things, and they don't even realize how they're impacting those around them with these habits. You know what I'm saying? So the kind of stuff that will happen in that area that needs to be discussed is say one of you is a neat freak. Everything is in its place and everything is clean and immaculate. The other one, not so much that way. When that one gets home, they take their shirt off, throw it over the chair. Go down the hall, kick off their shoes. Around the corner, there's their sock. Guess what? Somebody's going to get angry. You know what I'm saying? And I think you would, too, if you were the one cleaning up and organizing and somebody came in in a matter of seconds and minutes had it all trashed out like that, that would be very annoying to you. That discussion should be had, and you need to come up with fair and equitable resolution. Now, this goes on and on. For instance, the toothpaste. Somebody likes to roll it up from the bottom and keep it neat. Somebody likes to grab it in the middle and squeeze it. That's annoying to people. The toilet paper, does it go over the top or does it come underneath? That annoys people. The ones that like it over the top can't find it when it's underneath. But anyway, it's annoying. But the people that like it underneath really like it that way, you know. So all these things have to be worked out. You go to the kitchen. Whoever's in charge of that kitchen, you need to listen because if you put the food away in the pantry wrong, they can't find anything. They're going to be very annoyed about that. What about the dishes and the silverware? So I'm just saying there's lots of little details. Why should we do things multiple times a day, every day, that's annoying somebody that we really care a lot about. Annoying them so much that it gets to where when it's time for us to come home, instead of thinking, oh baby, I'm so glad you're home, we're thinking, oh garbage, is it already time for you to be home again? Uh, up and running again. And you will have a realistic expectation of what kind of effort it's going to take, what kind of time it's going to take, and what steps you need to take to make it happen. So with that information, you should be able to fine-tune lesser traumatic relationships with friends and different ones around at church and in the community at work, you know. But you've got the tools. You will have the tools where you could overhaul a relationship, you know. That's what we're doing tomorrow at 2. Tomorrow morning, we're going to be dealing with children because children are high maintenance and they are born manipulation experts and they get that from their mamas and daddies and grandparents and stuff this has been going on for generations and I have to say part of it is survival skills the Lord knows we're going to need some survival skills when we come into this world but I tell you I've seen little newborn babies in a matter of days and weeks they learn that they can use those same survival skills to get what they want, when they want it, and how they want it. And that's when it starts feeling real manipulative to the parents. And parents start thinking thoughts like, will I ever have a minute to myself ever again? You know. But tomorrow, during the divine worship hour, we're going to be dealing with that. And you get a handout with each of these. And remember, this is not just for you. It is for you. But it's for your ministry because you will have a ministry 
church or whoever the Lord tells you to minister to, he will point out who needs some help, you know, and you will be equipped to do that, to help them. Now, marital satisfaction. I am satisfied with most aspects of my couple relationship, or you could say with my best friend relationship or with my work relationships or whatever. But the idea is how does that come out? It's like, yeah, it's mostly good or no, nothing seems to be working or yeah, this is okay, but that's terrible. But anyway, you just kind of figure out. It's just an overview of the whole thing. You know what I'm saying? So that's all I want to say about that one. It's just an overview to give you a pulse of the whole thing. Because I've had couples come to me and I've asked them, you know, what's going on? And one of them proceeds to tell me, I think we're doing pretty good. And the other one's going, oh, no. I, you know, this is not working at all. In fact, I'm thinking about, I want a divorce. And the other one's just, just shocked. And I'm thinking, and then the other one is saying, I've been trying to tell you for months now, you know, so what's going on? Is somebody not listening or what? Is it denial? I don't know. How does it get like that? I don't think we're communicating, do you? But I want to help you communicate. I want to help you listen. That's what tomorrow afternoon's about. I want to help you understand some things. This gives you a broad view of the big important areas that need to be worked out respectfully and politely and courteously to where when you look down the list, you may have slid his way on that one and her way on this one because that one was more important to him, this was more important to her. And you get down here and you're totally in agreement on all of those. But when you look down the list, it's fair and equitable, not selfish and one-sided. That will not work. So now, personality issues. Do you like your partner's personality and habits? Do you like your friend's personality and habits? Do you like your children's personality? Do you like, you know, your church family's personality and habits? Let me use this example. I like to tell our Marines, I say, look, you may think you're a funny guy and you're telling these jokes, but if you're the only one laughing, maybe you're not quite as funny as you think you are. You know, something to think about. And why should we annoy our friends every day with our sense of humor that they do not appreciate? You know what I'm saying? I don't know that that's wise management of the relationships. It gets to where instead of saying, oh, look, Pastor Masson's coming. His wife is going, oh, no, look who's coming, you know. So it's just one of those things. So we need to, we need to work on this, I think. It's biblical, definitely biblical. You know, we're to be friends to one another. And in order to be friends, you have to be a friend. And this is all about being a friend, you know. And certainly, uh, we need to apply it in our marriages, but certainly with our brothers and sisters at home as well as in the church. So, another thing is, just let me point this out. Lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. Um, we don't realize how negatively we're impacting others. We don't realize it's as bad as it really is. So you might have the habit of going home and relaxing and sitting there and picking your nose, wiping it on the furniture. If your wife tells you to stop doing that, I think you ought to stop. That's socially unacceptable, right? I believe all your friends would appreciate you better, too, if you would stop. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. That's just one little silly example. But it's very real because that is our filter. It's filtering stuff out of the air, and it does get kind of clogged up. So what do you do about that? Maybe we need some tissues or something. I don't know. We get a hold of some tissues. But anyway... But anyway, that's just, just a little idea, but lots of other things can be discussed in all of these areas and what we're doing. Now, the next one, communication skills, being able to share your feelings and understand each other, your feelings and whatnot. Conflict resolution, being able to discuss and resolve differences instead of arguing over and over and over to ad nauseum and nothing ever getting fixed. Everybody gets totally discouraged about it. 
That's what we're dealing with tomorrow afternoon at 3. We're going to dive into that because that's so important. That takes a whole other presentation. I, I can't do a nutshell for that. I'm going to do a presentation for those two. Those are very important. Now, financial management, agreeing on your budget and your financial matters. This is one of the big three, right? Our money. This is huge. I've heard horror stories about wives spending $20,000 earned while drawing hazardous duty pay while out on the battlefield, you know, and the soldier or the Marine coming home and going, what, you spent all of that money? And they were out there risking their lives and receiving a little extra money. They thought they, that's kind of very disappointing, you know what I'm saying? But let me say this, if you are an impulsive buyer, Think about that. Are you an impulsive buyer? That can be a problem. But a lot of times people don't take it seriously. Now, you can get help for that problem, and you can fix that problem. But if you don't, let me tell you a little scenario that can happen with that, with the finances. Just say that a couple realizes that they're having some financial problems. So they go to their financial advisor, and they come up with a budget, and they learn what to do. They got it all figured out. They've got money and savings so they can buy a house eventually or a car and maybe even take a little three-day cruise because you can find good deals sometimes on these things. And they'd still have money in there for the house. They both have money in their pockets. All of the bills are paid because everybody needs a little money in their pocket. You don't have to tell one another what you're doing with that money because, you know, it's your money. But let's say, let's say... He is an impulsive buyer. He hasn't taken it seriously and he hasn't gone and gotten help for it. So several months go by, they're getting quite a bit of money saved up. So he's driving along and he sees this auto parts store that's having a closeout sale. So he goes in there and they've got this little spoiler that he's been wanting for his little sports car for several years now, marked way down below a half price. But it's all sales final, but man, he just can't hold back. He's an impulsive buyer, so he buys it right there on the spot. Goes home and tells his wife what he's done, and she's going, what is it? And so he's trying to explain to her what it is, and she wants to know, why do we need it? And so he's trying to explain to her why they need it, and then she finds out he'd spent all the money and savings for it. I think that would hurt her, don't you? It would hurt him if she did that to him. She didn't even talk to, he didn't even talk to her about it, you know. That's her money too, right? It's both of your money. So all of a sudden he realizes, uh-oh, I goofed. And he apologizes profusely and promises never to do it again. But he still doesn't take his impulsive buying problem seriously and doesn't go get help. So after several months goes by and they get the money saved up again, he goes and does it again. Now, guess what? After this happens several times, and she's done everything in her power to help him realize how important this is, or vice versa, he does everything in his power to try to help her understand how important it is. After a while, the hurt is going to turn into fear. Fear that this is never going to change, that you're never going to have a financial future, that you're always going to be broke, and you're going to end up homeless and out under the bridge fear and it becomes a deal breaker it's like I can't live like this I can't raise my children like this I don't want to live like this you know what I mean so all these things are very very important that's one of the big three we've got to take them seriously and do something intelligent about them like it says in the little book we need to enter into the relationship understanding its responsibilities and we need to enter into it intelligently. So we're trying to be intelligent about this. And we're looking at research. Research is the scientific method of careful observation of God's creation. And human beings are part of God's creation. So if we observe human beings and what's happening with human beings and why they say it's happened, maybe we could learn something to help all of us, right? So. Now, leisure activities. Do you share some similar interests and spend time together and apart? You don't have to spend all time together, but you should have some time together. 
with your best friends. There should be something you like to do together. There needs to be balance. Like Belle Jean's got her quilting buddies and stuff. I don't hang out with them because I'm not a quilter. She's got her musician friends. I'm not really a musician. I like musicians. I like music, but she hangs out with them. I might hang out with the hot rodders. I'm kind of interested in that, you know? So I, you know, so, um, but there could be some crossover. Maybe they're having food and they invite, you know, I'll come. Like I met a, a, a very interesting fellow that's a, the husband of one of her quilting buddies who had this little 37 Ford pickup truck that he had restored totally into a hot rod, had won like 47 trophies for that little car. And he sold it for $47,000 to somebody that came up with a big 18 wheeler and loaded it up and took it as a Christmas present or a birthday present, I think, for some family member, you know. But it was a cool little truck. I really enjoyed checking it out. But uh, you need to be balanced there with that because if, if all of your time is spent with your buddies, your wife is going to wonder, do you, I don't even know whether you love me. I'm quite sure you don't like me. You don't seem to want to be around me at all. And if it was her doing that, I'm, I'm sure the husband would be doing the same thing. Why would you marry me? You don't seem to want to be around me. I mean, you're going to feel left out, aren't you? So it needs to be balanced. Just have a good balance there to where you're spending proper time with one another. Now this one, sexual expectations. Are you comfortable discussing sexual issues and preferences? Now let me say this about that one. As a Christian, I've been looking at this and thinking about it, studying about it, and here's what I believe. I believe that the Creator, I believe our God, put a couple of things in place to preserve life. For instance, if we stop eating, what's going to happen? We'll die. But we need to use our brains that God gave us because there's stuff out there being sold for food that should not be sold for food. Some of us call it junk food. Like I was mentioning earlier, that's killing people. You know? So we do need to be smart about it or we're killing ourselves with it. But God has intimately connected this whole process of eating with the pleasure center of the brain so that people really, really, really enjoy eating. You know what I'm saying? But we, get, we need to use our brains, right? Because we might take the very thing God's given us to preserve life and be using it to destroy our lives. And... Uh, the other one is, if we quit having sex, what's going to happen? Some of the Marines told me we won't be having any more fun, but that was their attitude about it. But anyway, so what'd you say? You were going to say something. Yeah, if the, the human race would die out. So God, once again, has taken that process and connected it very intimately with the pleasure center of the brain so people really, really, really enjoy sex. But once again, we need to use our brains because the professionals are telling us that there's more than 20 sexually transmitted diseases out there, and some of them are annoying, and others are excruciatingly painful and yet others are lethal, and nobody wants any of them, right? So, so we need to use our brains about this, right? Plus, you all have noticed that that's how children get here, right? So some people think they can have relationships with benefits and all this. I think that's dangerous. Because I've even talked to people who were taking precautions and using contraceptives, and they're going, oh, I'm pregnant. So how does it happen? I don't know. But somehow, something goes wrong. So that's how children get here. And like I was saying a while ago, children are high maintenance. And uh, I'll be sharing a very excellent little parenting tool that's part of what I'll share tomorrow during the worship hour that is very useful, I believe. It's the best one I've seen but I'm going to share it in conjunction with scriptures and spirit of prophecy that is powerful stuff on the subject of Christian parenting. 
So, now, children and parenting. We agree on issues related to having and raising children. Here's something that happens, is sometimes one parent is more lenient than the other one thinks they should be, and sometimes one of them is more dictatorial and more heavy-handed than that other one thinks they ought to be. This becomes a tug of war. One becomes even more lenient, trying to make up with the overhanded overbearingness of the other one. That one's saying we're, we're destroying and ruining our children, so they become over, more overbearing, trying to make up for their leniency. People get divorced over all of this stuff. Remember that, that this stuff can be a deal breaker in a relationship. It becomes very stressful. And, um, and you've got to decide, are we going to have children or not? I had been at one installation for only a week. I came there to do an assignment when this gentleman who just got back from a nine-month deployment called me up and said, Marvin, when I got back, my wife told me she wanted a divorce. Furthermore, she told me she wants to marry my best friend. And he says, can you help me? I said, wow. I said, you got an intense situation there. I said, I said, we, we can sure try. And he said, well, here's her phone number. Call her and ask her if she'll meet with us because she won't talk to me. So I called her and I told her. I said, he's taking it real hard. I said, could we meet and talk about it? And uh, she agreed to meet with us in the park. And he was sitting there like, why or when or what happened, you know? And she told him, boom, exactly. She said, do you remember over at so-and-so what night? And and I saw his eyes. They, he understood what she was talking about. And as I listened to them, what I found out was they had been childhood sweethearts. They went to grade school together, to middle school, and to high school. They'd been married for 15 years. And they had started arguing more intensely during the past couple of years on this business of having a child. He had led her to believe that when they got settled down and they got some money saved back, they would have a child. But they started getting into arguments and prior to his deployment, he laid down the law to her and he said, we are having no children, period, end of story, don't bring it up again. That just devastated her. She became so depressed. She just, she just felt like he had been lying to her and that was something to her that was her fulfillment. She could not believe that she would live and die and never have a child. That was something that would make her very happy. That's what she wanted. So she was very discouraged. She started going to community functions while he was gone, you know, as we do. His friend would be there. She knew him. They talked. They began to find out that they had a lot of similar interests, you know. And so as they talked, they realized that both of them wanted children too. She finally, over the course of time, began to think that his best friend would make her very happy and she didn't even think he even cared about her happiness or had any desire whatsoever to try to make her happy. And so she became very emotionally attached to the friend and very emotionally detached from her husband. And uh, he still appeared, he still did not want any children. I don't know what the deal was with that. But so it'd be nice if we talked about these things early on in the very beginning and get these things figured out because it's going to end up being a problem. And one thing I say about this is that if you don't work it out in a fair and equitable manner in a respectful way, the likelihood of a future divorce is greatly increased. That can happen. So these are just important to people. Some of them are more important than others, but we should open and talk about it. Now, family and friends. Do you feel good about your relationships with relatives and friends? Here's what I like to say about that. We live in an imperfect world. We're born into imperfect families and raised by those imperfect families. And we grow up in imperfect communities. And we live in an imperfect world. And it honestly never ceases to amaze me how any of us figure out how to have any sliver of a measurement of happiness 
for success given this environment that we're in. And no, even in school, we don't learn hardly any of these things that we need to be learning. We're learning really bad habits of thinking and talking and acting that are not helpful to us at all. We learn those growing up and we keep doing those. We don't realize how bad they are and how annoying we are to other people. But so this is very important. But let me say this. Since nobody's perfect, she may have a lot of things to say about her family and her friends. And you may have a lot of things to say about your family and your friends because nobody's perfect. Everybody's got some annoying traits and whatnot. But don't you start talking about her family and her friends and she should not start talking about yours because that's going to be offensive. And you're going to start thinking thoughts and speaking words like this. Well, wait just a minute. Those are my friends. You don't even know them, and they're not like what you're saying at all. So it's not going to be good. And talking about the family, something like this is going to happen. It's like, yeah, yeah, you're talking about my mama, but look at your mama and your sister too. You know what I'm saying? So I would say don't touch that with a 10-foot pole. You know what I'm saying? Stay clear of that. Let her talk about hers. You talk about yours. Unless those family members and those friends are leading you where you're getting big fines and spending time in jail, maybe you should have that conversation. And if it's a very emotional subject, maybe you need a, a professional to help you for no, no other reason than to be a referee or maybe a mediator for you. But that discussion might need to happen in that case because you're going to have to protect yourselves. They're going to take you down the tubes with them, you know. So... Now, role relationships. Do we agree on how to share decision-making and responsibilities? Now, it's my understanding that God gives every one of us our gifts, and he gives us our interests as well. Plus, he provides opportunities for us to, to develop our interests and our gifts. So when, when you get married, or even with best friends, you need to share, or even with brothers and sisters, we need to share, right? take turns and not just hog everything. Uh, but it's very important that you share. If both of you have the same gifts and talents and interests, you need to share that equitably so that both of you feel like you're doing things that you both love to do, you know? And, um, and if you're really good at something and she's not, then you ought to do that. And if she's really good at something and you're not, then, you know, you ought to do that. She ought to do what she's good at. And then the stuff that nobody wants to do, like picking up the dog do in the backyard, don't pile that all on one. That's not fair. You know what I mean? So if you pick up the dog do, maybe she needs to clean the toilets or something. I mean, you know, just work it out so that it's fair and equitable. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense at all? Okay, so now spiritual beliefs holding similar religious values and beliefs. Now, this is extremely important to people. Remember, all of these have become deal breakers in relationships. They've all been identified. These are very important. People get into arguments about their spiritual beliefs and so forth. I don't think we should argue about anything, really. But this is so important. The subject needs to be open for discussion. And if one of you is different, you do your research, you share that with the other one. If you did some really good research, it makes sense. Then maybe the other one could do their research. You might, you might decide to change or something. But be respectful in working these things out. So, you know. Now, life transitions. Are you open to change in your life and lifestyle? So let's say that when you got married, for instance, that both of you were meat and potatoes people. Then as you go along, one of you starts studying it out and have some friends and so forth, and you decide to become a total vegan vegetarian. Now what are you gonna do? I think, you know, you can't force one another, right? You can't, that's not gonna work. I think you should be, uh, respectful don't you if for instance she says you know what 
I'm going to prepare a meal. I think you will love it. I really, I know you. I think you will love it. You shouldn't have an attitude like, no, I'm not going to, you know, you shouldn't have that stupid attitude. You ought to say, baby, you fix that meal and I'll, I'll see, I'll be there, you know. Try it. And if it's good, tell her that was absolutely delicious. And next time you make that, don't forget to invite me, you know. If it's not so good, let her know. You know, it was okay, but it wasn't my favorite. She'll know not to do that one again. Or it could be him as the chef, you know, different ones. Maybe he's a chef, maybe, you know. But I think it should be open, don't you? Doesn't that make sense? We need to be respectful, fair and equitable about these things and work it out. So now intergenerational issues, agreeing on how to deal with children, parents, and grandchildren. Some people don't like certain age groups. You know, some people don't like to be around children so much. So they have kind of a body posture and a position. Some people don't like their in-laws, you know? And so they have kind of an attitude and so forth. And in the process, some of these people that are very important to you do not feel comfortable in your home. So you're going to have to have a discussion about that. And probably the other person doesn't even, they haven't even thought about how they're impacting others, you know. But if you let them know, they should be willing to say, wow, you know, I hadn't even thought about that, but you're right. And you should try to do something about that so that people like your family is very important to her. She shouldn't be running them off because she's got an attitude toward them. You shouldn't be running her family off. What about the children? You shouldn't be running your children off and their parents because they're important to you. So it's an important thing, but w this is another one of the deals that people say, we just were destroying this and everything else and it just wasn't working. But people feel strongly about these things, you know, because even though we know our families are not perfect, we still love them, don't we? And we want them to feel welcome in our home. So these things need to be discussed and worked out in a fair and equitable manner. Now, health issues, having a positive attitude about health, aging as a couple. I've already talked about health, you know. But some people don't age well. And I think the reason they don't age well, tell me what you think about that, is because all their eggs are in one basket. He's thinking, I am a hunk. I'm God's gift to women. She's thinking, I am a gorgeous babe, God's gift to men. But the thing of it is, if you live long enough, all that beauty is going to fade. It's going to get wrinkled and flabby. Even if you're taking real good care of yourself, you know, you're going to be able to tell as you're getting older. Some guys go into a crisis. They call it the midlife, midlife crisis. And they start doing stupid stuff. Very stupid. And they keep on until literally their wife can't stand it anymore and she wants a divorce and now she is with some other man and their children are being raised by some other man and there you are home alone all wrinkled and flabby that's a sad story you know what I'm saying don't do that you know what I'm saying don't do that so and then the health thing, I've already talked about that. Health is very important. We need to pay attention to that. But even if we're having health problems, amazingly, God can help us fix those by living according to his natural laws. But we need God's help because our human nature totally goes against doing what God wants us to do. That's just the way it is. So it's a miracle. That's why God calls it the new birth and being born again because it, it, he has to recreate us, recreate our thinking, are talking, are acting, and he is capable of doing that. You know, he's the only one that can help us. But with him, we can do all things. So, but it is a process, it takes time. And um, it does require some sacrifice. We have to sacrifice some idol, some, some indulgence that we just love. Even though we found out that it's killing us, we just don't want to let go of it, you know. So, We've got to have God to help us, and he will help us with all of these things, with everything. Does this make sense at all? I would like for you to pray that this would become part of your ministry, okay? So it has to become yours. The Holy Spirit can help that become yours. You, might sub you can use some of my illustrations if you want, but you'll come up with some of your own.
you might start using all your own you know after a while all right that's the conclusion see you tomorrow at the 11 o'clock hour and even before for for Sabbath school for the Bible study and then in the afternoon at three really you're going to want all of this I hope you don't have to miss any of it so say it again oh yeah oh that's a very good point are there any questions about anything that's been said or any comments yes Yeah, they, they've got all kinds of materials with that program. They've got a, a textbook, and they've got a workbook, and then they have a, like a seminar that you can do a seminar, how you can present it in a seminar fashion. But, uh, and I, there's a lot of good in there, but, um, and if you need more, that that's probably a, a good one. I also think that that book, it's an old book. Sometimes you can pick it up pretty cheap at like a used bookstore. But um, what is it? Um, men are from Mars and women are from Venus. A lot of good illustrations in there, really practical illustrations of true life stuff that goes on. Uh, and, and they, to me, we need to look at all of this. Now, I've been told that all of this is more or less in that book and uh, but I had somebody else tell me they read the book and they said they actually the the examples and illustrations they like mine better it helped to wrap their minds around it and realize how important it was so I don't know I haven't actually read the book but I think it's a pretty good book uh, that one about Mars and all it's good I don't agree with the concept about this I think it really has to do with being respectful and being able to communicate and listen and be able to fairly work things out to where it's balanced and equitable for everybody. But I recommend this book. Those subjects, those six chapters on relationships, whether it be children, the mother, the couple, really good really good and uh, also I'll be talking more about it I'll be quoting a little bit from the testimonies to the church powerful stuff in the testimonies so but yeah if you want to read those are good those are pretty decent books is there anything else is there a comment or a question So either, do you have one, Pastor? You have something? Yeah, I'm just thinking about when it comes to compromising, you know, um, sacrificing some of the stuff that you like to make the other person happy. Um, when do you actually, you know, decide, okay, um, this time around, That's a, that's a very good question because people get caught in that circle, but it really needs, we need to have open communication about all things and we've got to be honest to ourselves too. And we've got to look at what we need. If it's something that we really need, the other person needs to understand that. And some of these things, truly, we may decide just to accept one another where we are. It may not be a moral issue or anything, but it's very important to you. This is very important to her. That's very important to him. And you decide to accept one another because that's so important or not. But, but when you look down the whole list, if it's not fair and equitable, if it's selfish and one-sided on everything, it's not going to work. 
because the very same thing that you mentioned, you're going to feel about the entire relationship. It's going to be uh, this marital satisfaction. Are you satisfied with most aspects? You're going to say, no, everything on there is selfishly skewed toward you. There's nothing for me. You know what I'm saying? So you've got to be honest and be able to talk about it and be able to s use words to where one another can understand and you've got to try to be fair. And actually, it takes God because we are born selfish. That's what it was saying. That's what I just read, that, that we need to learn, you know, uh, we need to learn not to be selfish. And God can help us with that. We have to have the Holy Spirit to help us. But that doesn't mean to totally sacrifice everything important to you. It just means that we need, both of us need to come up with something that makes sense. Where both of you look at it and go, this is fair. This is doable. We can do this. You know. And you can accept one another in some area. Because it's not a moral issue or anything. It's not a great eternal truth of God. But it's like a personal preference or something. See, now you're anticipating my subject for 3 p.m. tomorrow because I spend close to an hour talking as fast as I can to help you understand all the nuances and the skills and the listening skills and everything to where you can actually work through these things and actually begin to, you know, pull that together. That is a very important question. And if you want to stay one more hour, let's just do it tomorrow. We'll answer it tomorrow. Plus, I'll give you some stuff in the morning that's really good stuff as well uh, for the whole family, for the children in particular. Um, is that it? Anybody else? So now we're starting to get questions that's taking us into the session for tomorrow afternoon. So maybe, maybe we're done. So that means that most of you didn't have any questions or comments. So like I'm thinking either I did a very, very good job of explaining it and you understand everything or, or maybe you don't understand anything. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. You understand everything, right? I, I, okay, good. And then we'll get the rest of it, because that was easy. We'll get that tomorrow. Okay, let's, let's bow our heads for prayer. Oh, by the way, I'm calling you to ministry. Use what I'm sharing with you as part of your ministry, you know, along with the scriptures, spirit of prophecy. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for your great love for us. Thank you for sending your son. We'd like to thank your son for volunteering to come and for all that he has done. Thank you for your mighty power that you can recreate us and restore us to your divine image once again. We have fallen, fallen, fallen deeply, terribly far from you. And we have habits of thinking, talking, and acting that are just wrong, totally wrong, very selfish. And we need your Holy Spirit. We must have your Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth and to build us up in Christ and to transform us once again into your likeness. So that's our desire, Lord. We pray that you will help us to build our ministry, that we will have our own personal ministry because you're calling each one of us to a ministry. 
and we'll be co-laborers with Jesus, with the holy angels, with the Holy Spirit. And so be with us as we go to our homes. Keep us safe. Bring us back tomorrow. Don't let anything get in the way. Help us to come here and really uh, benefit from the rest that there is. And we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.